All righty, I want to welcome all of you traders to today's presentation. This is Day Trade Safe, and as you can tell from the name of our company, we are about day trading. So this is not position trading, it's day trading. And if ever there were an environment that needs emotional stability and discipline, believe me, it's day trading. My name is Michael Guest, as David was kind enough to share with you. And I want to say a big thank you to David for making it possible for Day Trade Safe to be part of this terrific lineup of great, great, great traders, especially our last one. All righty. First of all, if you'd like to stop sabotaging your trading, You've had revenge trading. You've had analysis paralysis. You've had all kinds of inconsistencies. I'm going to give you some tools, tips, and techniques for achieving real emotional discipline. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, it goes without saying. If you're emotional, don't trade. If you have just had a loser and you're pretty bummed out about it, don't take the next trade. Let yourself settle down. That's common sense. So I, I know I'm preaching to the choir and that's not exactly high level information, but let's start off simple there, okay? And you want to try to be as close to a machine as possible because neutrality is your goal. You want to be like the software itself that you're using. It doesn't care. It doesn't know what's going on. Now, you might, but you've got emotions as part of the package that's inside your head. And my background in psychotherapy, I used to be an analyst before I became a trader 30 years ago, has equipped me to address these issues. So I want you to know that if you're upset, it doesn't have to be because you've had a loser. It could also be if you had a big winner and you're so thrilled finally a big one don't jump into another trade you have got to let yourself get back to neutral and i'll show you tools and techniques to do that so don't worry i will give that to you but if you don't have neutrality you can't execute consistently that's the key because otherwise you're going to end up being one of those revenge traders, digging deeper and deeper holes, or you might get analysis paralysis and be too paralyzed to even want to take a trade. Oh, my goodness gracious. We don't want that. I'm going to go ahead for a moment and move over to my other monitor and move that question chat window where I can see what I'm presenting on the other monitor also. Okay, I am back. So with that being said, you got to pay attention to what's going on between your two ears, folks. Let's face it. A lot of traders that I have trained, and I have trained over 4,000 traders over the last 20-some years. And I can't tell you how many guys or gals, but mostly guys say, oh, well, I don't have emotions. I don't, I'm, I'm pretty normal. You know, I just take those trades and I don't get real upset. Uh, I don't notice anything. Everybody has emotions. Trust me. You just aren't paying attention to them. Now you may be also annoyed that's a form of an emotion. You may be bored. You may be actually amused about the way the market is behaving. But as RK just said, of course, we're emotional whenever money's involved. Let's face it. Money is one of the biggest triggers we got other than sex. <laughs> and for some of us more. <laughs> so whatever it is that changes your internal state of mind, gets it off center, <clears throat> pardon me, you need to be able to manage it. 
because your emotions are going to drive the actions that lead to the trades you take. Let's face it. You may think you're as logical as can be a total type A left brain kind of guy or gal. And you may think, oh, shoot. Uh, I'm very logical. Nothing ever bothers me. But the truth of the matter is it's barely beneath your awareness because there isn't any such thing as I don't have emotions. So you got to pay attention before you take the trade. Notice your state of mind and pay attention to it while you're taking the trade, while you're managing it. I don't mean ignore the trade and just pay attention to your emotions. I'm just saying yeah, you can notice if you're getting a little tightening in the stomach or if your breathing is shallow or you're just forgetting to breathe sometimes. And especially afterwards, notice what your state of mind is. Because guess what? You know who's running the show? You have an automated slave. No, it's not a robot, but it might as well be. It is your subconscious. It flat out runs your life. We're on autopilot pretty much 90 plus percent of the time. I mean, do you stop and think how to tie your shoelace? No. Do you have to stop and think about when you pick up the keys to put them in your pocket or put them in your purse? No. It's automatic. These are little subroutines that run in your subconscious. And thank goodness for them, because, you know, your subconscious was created when we were real little bitty kids, or infants, frankly. But it built and built and built simple stuff. We formed emotional attachments and reactions to certain scenarios like somebody might have yelled at us if we did a certain something and we associated if we ever do that certain something we expect some kind of negative reaction like so i'm going to get yelled at or something bad's going to happen to me same thing about money you know all our attitudes about money didn't kick in when we started trading they were formed our values when we were little kids. So that is something that has to be addressed. And no, I'm not going to be a therapist here and try to help you psychoanalyze yourself and cure some kind of problem you had when you were a kid. That's not what I do. First of all, I want you to know that your subconscious is there for you to help you. It has no sense of time whatsoever. It's in the moment of right now, 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 all the time. It's now, now, now. And it doesn't understand shades of gray. It's either yes or no. That's it. It's pretty cut and dried. So your subconscious is really going to be working for you but it's kind of dumb. It all depends on the instructions it gets, at least instructions that it can believe in, because it tries to do whatever it thinks is best for you. If it thinks that you're giving it something that is going to run counter to what it thinks its mission is to help you in some way around this particular task or event or something, it won't do it. It'll fight you in some way. It'll sabotage you. And that's where the sabotage comes in with your trading. It doesn't have the ability to do critical thinking like your forebrain. That's what you do when you size up a trade or you figure it out whether or not the market is going to do this or do that. That's critical thinking. But the emotional side and sort of like muscle memory, things happen on automatic. Once you've trained and trained and had a routine, your subconscious is going to do that. So keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this. 
Here's another thing that can help you a lot. If you are a day trader, please, please don't sit on your butt all day long. Take frequent breaks, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Get out of your chair or at least after a trade because you want to get rid of that brain fog. Doctors are very fond these days of saying sitting, it's the new smoking. So if you just sit there all morning long with FOMO, you know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. And you say, oh, I don't want to miss that next trade. Mm -mm. Well, you got to clear the brain fog because the longer you sit there, the less you're able to think critically and quickly and make those quick decisions. So if you get up, get out of your chair, at least stretch, or maybe do some minor exercise. And please remember to rehydrate, drink lots of water. The more water you drink, the better. And try not to drink so much coffee. You'll get jacked up too much if you drink too much coffee or if you're a fan of Red Bull or any of those energy drinks. That's not going to help you. If you're in decent shape, you won't need them. Now, here's another thing. If you're going to try something you've never tried before in trading, and this does relate to emotions, you need to test it with sim trading. Don't try that latest indicator or system or whatever you might have invested in and say, oh my God, I'm so excited. I've invested in it. I want to make that money back right now. I want that money. And you start trading real money. Boy, that's a fast track to blowing up your account. You need to calibrate to it. Now, I'm going to cover something called benchmarking a little bit later in this presentation, and I'll show you how to do it. Because benchmarking is what professionals do to get calibrated to something they haven't done before, whether it's a new market, a new system, or something else. So whatever it is that's new, make sure you've tried it out with sim trading. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the same thing as trading with real money, except you're not tying it to your actual account. It's just going to show you that you had a winner or a loser on the screen. And it's paper trading. It's a fake trade. But if you use software that's professional grade caliber, like Ninja Trader, highly recommended. I don't get any money for saying it. I'm just extremely fond of it. You can sim trade and even replay trade things over and over and over until you get acclimated to something and can prove it to your own satisfaction. So don't jump off in the deep end of the pool before you have tested things. So as I mentioned that word benchmark, ideally anything that's new for you, you should benchmark it. Uh, as I said a little later on, I will go through the process of what benchmarking means and how you can accomplish it and what you can expect from it. Okay. So, and if possible, if you have an actual true mechanical trading system, something that's either automated or at least semi-automated, then what you're going to need to do is backtest it and find out how it holds up. You're going to want to see, is it producing more winners than losers? What's its drawdown and all the other little variables that are critical to whether or not something is worthwhile. If it is really a true fully automated system, then you may have the ability to optimize it. I know Ninja Trader lets you adjust variables and it can do all kinds of optimization, just please avoid curve fitting and over optimization because that'll make it such a narrow set of circumstances that it will only work for a while and then it'll break. 
the trade safe trade domination system that I have is very robust. I haven't had to change a single fundamental condition or rule in over 20 years. That's how robust it is. So once you've got these things in place, you want to be able to stay in your lane. What does that mean? You got to have routines. Routines are the bread and butter of what feeds your brain. Your brain is a pattern recognition machine. It's a meaning making machine. If you've got routines that are consistent all the time, your brain loves it. What throws your brain off and gets your subconscious all in a tizzy is if you keep throwing different instructions or trying different things from trade to trade to trade. You know what the real holy grail of trading is? It isn't some rocket science indicator or even the best mechanical trading system in the world. Consistency. Consistency is what you want. Because as I will bring up later, trading is a business. And ask any successful business person, what is the most important thing they want? consistency. That is what you should shoot for. You've got to have a method or a true system that you can stick to. So please try to avoid. Don't try just a flat out. Don't try different things on all kinds of different trades like, well, I learned from this and that guru 12 years ago. He said, when I see this, this is going to work better. And now, even though I'm doing something different, I'm seeing that thing I saw 12 years ago. I'm going to flip over and try what I learned 12 years ago. It doesn't work that way. Find something that is what you can stick with right now under all conditions. Now, one way to condition yourself to sticking to things, and let me see, uh, I'm reading a question here saying I've got a semi-automated system makes money on some account, but my real account, it loses money in minutes. I turn on the automated trade on SIM account at 930. It makes 415. Then I turn on the real one at 945, blah, 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 blah. How is your system going to be different than that? I will address that issue near the end of this presentation. You betcha. Because first of all, the system that I use, truly a Boolean logic rules-based mechanical system, in addition to all of these things I'm showing you to maintain your uh, psychological equilibrium, and I'm falling behind, I don't want to do that, uh, is the fact that I want you to be in control as to whether to pull the trigger and take that trade or not. And I'll tell you why when we get to benchmarking, okay? So bear with me. So this is helpful self-hypnosis can really help your subconscious be what can i say it'll condition it to wanting to do the same thing over and over again when it sees a certain stimulus that it recognizes and let's face it it's not woo woo hypnosis has been around medically even for almost a hundred plus years, uh, it is not some parlor game, and your subconscious thrives on hypnosis. So you got to make sure that if you're going to program your subconscious, you use the right kind of suggestions to build the kinds of belief systems that'll run on autopilot, because that is what your subconscious does. And it'll support you in achieving that holy grail of consistency and getting the results you want in your trading. That way, you don't have to think about, should I take this trade or not? It's like the muscle memory. You know, if Michael Jordan had done 10,000 baskets, he doesn't think about his next one. He just flips that ball and shoots his basket. Of course, he's not playing anymore, but when he was at the peak of his performance, that was it. He never stopped practicing. So hypnosis can help you 
do that. It'll reinforce your confidence and your belief in your in abundance. So I'm not going to recommend a specific program per se. There are way too many of them out there, but I will tell you a resource you might want to look into that even though it's got a little woo-woo in it, as far as choices of things it offers, some of the hypnosis programs that it offers uh, are straight up your alley. And it's called mindvalley.com. That's all one word, Mind Valley. And uh, it has other things on how to run a business or how to have good relationships or how to be healthy. So it's not a woo-woo place. I want you to know that. So check it out and uh, look for, do a search while you're in there uh, and look for something on confidence or maybe something on prosperity or whatever, because that's what your brain is going to be wanting. It's going to want those kinds of suggestions. Now, let's face it. We get really keyed up during day trading. If ever there were an environment that is stressful, let's admit it. I mean, if you've got money on the line, you're going to feel a certain degree of tension. Now, I'm not telling you to meditate while you trade, of course. What I am going to suggest is that you can actually lower that stress threshold, its baseline, if you will, by being a meditator. And again, this is not woo-woo. It'll help you maintain focus and clarity when you trade. It'll reduce your stress levels, and it'll give you that kind of emotional well-being that makes you, frankly, a, a much nicer person to be around. So it is not a religion. This doesn't come against anything that's out there. It's been scientifically proven over and over and over again for so many decades to actually work. Now, it supports, above all, calmness so that it's easier to get back to neutral. That's why I'm recommending it. Now, when do you do it? I personally like to do it in the evening, maybe before I go to bed. Other people like to do it in the morning first thing. It's a personal choice. But some people say, well, which kind of meditation? I'm not here to tell you because there's all different kinds of meditation. And you can certainly find resources on the Internet to do it. But I'm going to give you a shortcut. This is a cheat. And this is an actual tool that I use. Biofeedback from a company called Muse.com. Now, what you do is you have this little headband and it's got little pads that touch parts of your head and they pick up your brain waves. And what that does is it feeds through Bluetooth into your phone, your smartphone. And what it'll do is your smartphone has a program that picks up, well, are you in beta wave? Well, that's your normal waking consciousness. Are you calm and centered in meditation? That's your alpha wave. Lower than that are the other theta and delta. Muse will give you feedback to let you know. You will always hear, well, it gives you many different types of programs, but I'm going to tell you the one I use. You hear the surf in the background. And if I get off track and I have a, kind of a distraction or something like that with my eyes closed the surf will pick up and it'll be much louder but the real thing that keys me into knowing i'm on track is i hear little birds chirping in the background when i know that i've had a certain number of birds after the end of a session i know i've had a very successful session so you might want to look into that that's kind of a shortcut all right so let's say you use these tools that I've been describing so far. How do you maintain them? You need guardrails to keep you on track. 
Your brain, as I said, loves structure. It's a meaning making machine. It wants patterns. It wants you to be consistent and you got to reinforce that consistency. So please don't keep changing your rules. If you found something that works, stick to it. And if you've had losers, well, then you got to know whether or not these losers are enough for you to be concerned to investigate and do something like I'll describe later called benchmarking. And you might want to make an adjustment on what those rules are, but don't do it while you're trading. Okay. Make sure you do it during a testing type phase when it's not during a trading time and you want to write it out. Don't type it out. Believe it or not, you form neural pathways when your hand holds a pen or a pencil and writes things. It really does. And far, and things do stick better. And you got to write out, okay, what's my maximum amount I'm willing to lose on a given stop? I mean, loss for a trade per contract if you're trading futures or whatever. And leverage is like, you know, how big a position do I want to maintain? You know, like uh, professionals, they'll say, I'm willing to lose one or 2%. A lot of retail traders will go up to two to 5%. Those that go above that, I'm concerned. But you got to write it all down and stick to it and review it frequently. If you need to make a change, then make that change. Actually, this all sounds suspiciously like what? a trading plan. Yeah. Are you using a trading plan? Hmm. I wonder how many of you do. If you're a day trader, too many day traders, they just jump right in and start trading. You know what? If you're in the woods and you don't have a map or a compass, you're lost. You got a plan before, during the actual session itself and after the session. That means write it out about what do you expect from the market. Look at the overnight trading session, for example. Notice where potential support and resistance levels might interfere with potential trades. Uh, or is there going to be uh, an economic report that would be really disruptive to a trade? So it's suicide to trade during a report. And make sure that during the day, if conditions change, as John said in the last uh, presentation, and we all know it from our own trading, if you're a day trader, these are volatile times. After all, this is election season, and that roils the markets, and the markets love calm and consistency. They're not getting it, and they've got Gaza going on. They've got the border crisis. They've got all kinds of crap going on. So what do you want? You want as normal a market as possible. Don't try to trade that volatility. Stay away from it. Let it calm down. And when you're done with your trading session, at the end of the day, what are you going to do? You want to review that trading plan and see, was it successful? Did I make the right choices? Did I not update it when I should have? If you do those little things, you're doing what is essentially what professionals do. Because when people join TradeSafe, they're not just getting software and personal coaching and a whole array of additional tools. They are actually, my ulterior motive is to train you to become a professional day trader so that you're not low on the food chain. Instead, you're in the top five or 10%. And I'll explain what that would look like a little bit later. So make sure that you include anything that's relevant in this trading plan. Things like I already mentioned reports. Don't trade before or during or immediately after a report if it's still volatile. If there's high volatility, definitely try to avoid it if possible, or at least drop to a different uh, time frame. Or if time frames don't work, Use a different type of bar. Use a tick bar because they have a smaller average true range. And it's a little bit less risk than on a time-based chart. You may have to keep adjusting.
But then there's context. And context is a wide open thing. It can be support, resistance, reports, price overextension, low volume. I could go on and on. It's anything that's not built right into your actual mechanical trading system. Because I'm going to go forward and assume that if you're trading a true mechanical system, this is what would apply. Because if all you're using are indicators and the guy or gal you bought it from said, yeah, my system does this. It's not really a system if it's not Boolean logic or if it's not almost totally automated. Mm -mm. It's got discretion in it. It's got subjectivity in it. Wherever you find those two, those are danger, danger, Will Rogers. Okay. So when you're done with your trading plan, review it for accuracy and relevance. And then why a business plan? Is that the same thing? No. I already told you, and you already have figured it out, I'm sure. Trading is a business. You should manage your trading like a business. Every one of my students gets a full-blown business plan. And because it's a business, I don't want them to just map out their pie-in-the-sky financial goals. That's not enough. Because anybody can say, oh, I'd love to make a million bucks at the end of the year. And that's not realistic. Even if you're the goat trader of all of time. No, nah. you got to be able to look at the guardrails and the limits. Here are some of the questions I have in my business plan for my students. And I read every single student's business plan when they come into my program and I give them feedback if I think they need to make an adjustment. For example, if you're a day trader, which is what my program is for, how many losers in a row are you willing to tolerate? And if you hit that number, what are you going to do? Keep going and dig a deeper hole. That's revenge trading, folks. You don't want to do that. Or are you going to just freeze up and have analysis paralysis and never take a trade? Well, you got to have it mapped out. How many? I mean, what are the consequences, rather, of too many losers in a row? And I don't know what that is for you. I could make a suggestion. You can come back from two in a row, but it's awfully hard to come back from three in a row. It can be done, but that depends on you and the market and a whole bunch of other variables. Now, here's another one. The amount you're willing to lose on a given trade, you better have a maximum on that one. And I tend to measure it not only on the whole trade, because I don't know how many contracts you might be trading if you're trading futures and commodities. And by the way, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of saying stock trading is not my preference. I could totally make a strong case about why futures and commodities, you can make more money much more easily. It's easier to trade. And come tax time, you'll get to keep more money if you do make money than you do trading the stock market. Because let's admit it, high frequency programmed algorithmic trading dominates along with specialists in the stock market. So ever since the mid nineties, I've been a, a futures and commodities trader. And I have found that I get all I need from that. You do not need to try to Look at all the possible stocks that there are in the world, 12,000 or more in the U.S. alone. It's hard to keep up with that stuff. There's too many variables. Instead, I would rather watch a few variables like a hawk and be darn good at watching them and making them work for me. That's why, for example, if you're a trend following trader, you might want to trade the indices because they are naturally trending or even better currencies. Why not Forex? Because Forex is much better suited for swing trading than day trading, unfortunately. So I'm not going to diss it. I'm just saying 
when it all comes down to it, I am going to recommend futures and commodities, and they are so very easy to trade. Less margin requirements, et cetera. So I'm going off on the deep end here. I'm going to stop that right now and just continue with that last entry I'm pointing to and saying, how much are you willing to lose on a per contract basis? That's a per unit. How about that? Because I don't know how many contracts you're going to trade. You're going to have to also say, what's my maximum drawdown? Are you going to say, if I hit 15%, I'm going to stop trading and reevaluate or make some adjustments or whatever is called for? Or is it 25%? I don't know. I work that out with my students. If you're all the way up to 50% drawdown, you're already in trouble. So you got to put those things in your business plan. And every business plan needs to be reviewed on a monthly basis at minimum. Now, of course, if conditions change more frequently, then by all means, you need to revise your business plan. Well, Danny pointed out to something I said earlier. He said, if you position size three in a row is manageable, that is... I'm going to say a big if there, there are other variables than just changing from say four to two contracts. For example, you still may minimize the damage, but it doesn't guarantee. The only other thing you might want to do if you're a futures trader is if you're trading the minis, M I N I S is switch to micro minis then you can continue trading if you really can't stop. But in my opinion, if you can't stop trading real money, then you've got an emotional issue going on. You've got trading discipline problems. So I would rather have people just say, I agree to this. This is my stop point. I won't trade anymore for today. I'll switch over to sim trading if I want to keep watching the market and see how it works. That would be my personal recommendation. And let's face it. Remember I said if you're in the woods and you don't have a map or a compass, you're lost. Well, if you don't track your statistics, you're lost. Too many people just say, well, my account's going up. I'm doing great. Or it's going down. I'm bad. Oh, you need far more detail. You need more granularity than that. You need to evaluate the true performance within your trading system about what's working and what is not working. You got to identify, for example, within the big four of the indexes, you got the Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, and the S&P, Okay. If you are trading those, not necessarily in trades and all of them at once, never, ever, ever be in more than one trade at a time, please. You're overloading your brain. Your brain can't process that much in an efficient and safe manner. Okay. So what you want is to limit it to a single trade. You want to be able to identify in your spreadsheet to come back to this, which markets are doing the best over a certain period of time this week, this month, and ongoingly for the year, which exit strategy that you're using. Maybe I do better at scalping. I'm more consistent than if I scale out because that's a different type of exit strategy. Now, in our system, we have three different types of exit strategies that are based and built on strength of trend. So if it's a super weak trend, you button get on base, you might want to scalp. Just go for a super quick and easy, load the boat, all in, all out, quick profit. But if you've got the wind at your back and you've got multiple charts, different settings that are all trading and trending in the same direction and it's not just the generic settings on your 
uh, drop down menu. You got to have specific settings, which I can't cover here. But that is going to inform you as to which exit strategy you want to use. You might want to scale out, hit a quick and easy profit target, and then trail a profit stop, because that way you can swing for the fences and stay in a trade as long as possible. Okay. Okay, I get what you're saying there as far as two in a row on day trading. Yeah, okay. All right, your statistics are so important if you're going to benchmark. I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to have to pick up the pace because I've still got more to cover, especially that benchmarking phase because it is so critical to your success. You will want to be able to benchmark, which is what professionals do. If they change something in the way they trade, either a system or a method or a market or something, they benchmark it without money over a period of time to discover whether or not over a statistically viable sample, whether there is real consistency. Is this thing going to work with money? Are we able to risk real money on this? Well, that's what we do with the trade safe system. Our whole approach is at the end of our course, we require you to be benchmarked. Now, I'll explain what benchmarking means in a moment. Well, I guess I'll just go ahead and do it. Let's assume that you have learned everything you can about what works and doesn't work with the trade safe system or whatever you're using, let's say. And what you're going to end up with is a full knowledge of, okay, I've seen this scenario before. Every time I get into this kind of trade with these conditions and there's support or resistance between my entry and my target, I know the odds aren't as good as if it weren't there, right? No, any dummy knows that. So you've learned these things. So what you do instead of when you're sim trading and learning stuff and learning from the losers as well as the winners, because that's important about what didn't work, in benchmarking, you are finally permitted to take only the best of the best and leave the rest because you're factoring in stuff like context. So I already talked about what kinds of context there might be. It might be reports. It might be price overextension. It might be support or resistance, et cetera. The point is when my students reach the point of benchmarking, they do this all by themselves. They don't have me looking over their shoulder, telling them what to do. They must have a statistically viable sample of a minimum of 30 trades. More is a lot better. And they get to pick the best of the best and leave the rest. And when they log all that in their spreadsheet, I meet with them privately and we review it. And basically I say, Ace, sorry about that. It was just an alarm letting me know I'm running out of time. I say, okay, tell me which market worked the best for you? Because we focus our training primarily on the indexes because I don't want to overwhelm them with trying to learn all kinds of markets. We're going to narrow their focus so they can just learn how the system works and then they can gradually expand to other stuff. All right, which market worked the best? Well, maybe they found the Russell work the best for them because it's nice and steady and slow, whereas the NASDAQ is like a ferret on speed. <laughs> but which chart worked the best? Maybe they got better results from a one-minute chart. Maybe they got better results from a tick-based chart. I don't know. Every trader is different. And then which exit strategy? work the best for them? Were they better at scalping or were they better at scaling out? Numbers don't lie. It's in your spreadsheet and everybody gets dialed in so that their psychology, their personality is matched up with the software. Nobody else does that. I don't know why they don't do that. 
because this is what a professional does. So if you're dialed in, you know that it's just a baby step into trading live with a real account instead of diving off in the deep end of the pool after you've bought an indicator or something and going, oh, I hope this works. So every single student since 2018, since I've been tracking these stats from my students, has achieved at least 87% or more winning trades during their benchmarking phase. Some of them even got in the high 90 percentile. So that's because they were properly benchmarked and trained. Journaling helped them get to that point. Why? Because journaling is so critical. You see, after having a true Boolean logic, mechanical trading system, no subjectivity, no discretion, and it's got a built-in edge, proven, and they have discipline because I've shown them how, and I will give you a tool at the end of this to show you how you can also achieve discipline besides hypnosis or meditation and those other things before. You really need to journal because journaling is your feedback tool. It tells you why a trade worked or it didn't work. Frankly, I'm more interested in the ones that didn't work because that's the stuff you want to stay away from. If you have a successful journal and you don't jump from trade to trade, because that's that fear of missing out, FOMO, don't let that afflict you. That's amateur behavior. Be a professional and journal. Because one of the greatest traders of all time, he's still around, Ed Sakota. Has anybody ever heard of him? I invited him to a local trading group and I said, tell me what makes you as good as you are? What do you recommend we all do? He said, well, of course you need a really good system. It needs to be as automatic as possible and you need to work on your personal discipline and emotions. We've covered those two, but he said, I journal every single trade. If you don't journal, you ain't going to make it folks. I took it to heart and I built one that's pre-formatted and I give it to my students so that all they got to do is just fill in the blanks. And there's even a section in there for context, support, resistance, price overextension, if the volume's too low or whatever, because they want to know why things work or don't work. That is so very, very critical. So if you're journaling and you've learned how to benchmark, where do you learn how to do all these things? Well, you got to get it from the people who are the best of the best. I can't tell you how many great coaches and mentors I paid probably over 40 grand in my first 18 months learning from. This was back in the very early 90s. And you know what? Some of them were terrible. And I'm not going to name drop because I don't want to get in trouble. Well, one of them is a very famous name and his advice was terrible but nonetheless i did have some good ones and i learned what to do that works but i had to take it for myself and make it my own but when you try to get somebody you got to make sure that they are very experienced first of all i've got 30 years or more as a professional day trader they got a winning system, which we do, and they know how to deal with trading psychology, the discipline issues, which is what this whole uh, event is all about. So you want to make sure that you have someone that can help you with those things and make sure they can encourage dialogue and include real personal coaching. In my coaching room, I don't call it a trading room. I call it a coaching room. Everybody has a microphone and we can talk back and forth to each other. No, I don't have hundreds of people in my room at typically a half a dozen people. That's right, because I'm very, very limiting on who I allow in my room so I can give you the kind of attention you really, really need. And I do something nobody else does. I provide personal coaching offline. If you need to talk to me on the phone other than in the room or even go in the room privately and let me see some stuff that you're doing, we can do that. 
that's included in the package. Plus, I know I do something nobody else does. I share their desktop and I can watch you take your own trades if you're really stuck. And I'll coach you right on through it so that you won't have that problem anymore. So it's not a copycat trading room. That is useless. You need a true coaching environment. Okay. Because I want to offer you more than software. It has to be full comprehensive training that will enable you to become a true professional. And that's going to include that benchmarking. So are you benchmarked? And by the way, that's way too much information there on the left. If you've got that much going on, you're overwhelming your brain. <laughs> Don't do that. The most important way to calibrate your software to your personality, because I don't know if you're aggressive. I don't know if you are conservative in your trading. I have no idea. You are going to get calibrated by being benchmarked. I already told you how it's done, and it'll dial you into your trading history and your trading choices about what charts work best, which time frames work best which automated trade management exit strategies work best, you will be so dialed in that it'll be uniquely yours. Because just like you and I have personalities, markets have personalities, and even the same market changes throughout the day. You know it, and I know it. It's highly volatile off the open, typically, often settles down, and sometimes when an event occurs, whether it's news or a report, it'll have some other reaction. So you got to know those things. And it's got to be statistically viable trade sample. And I review it so that you will have at the end of picking the best and ignoring the rest, factoring in your context, know what works truly for you so you can trade really with real money that is calibrated to your personality. So this way, you're not just trying to buy off the shelf stuff and hoping that it works for you. That's why so many people keep going from the next to the next to the next to the next. They never got calibrated or benchmarked. Now, this one may seem like woo-woo to you. It's called Emotional Freedom Technique or EFT. How many of you have heard of this? I know probably a lot of you have heard of Neuro Linguistic Programming or NLP. And I was originally trained by the founders of NLP, Bandler and Grinder at Stanford when they first developed it in the 70s. So I'm highly skilled, but that's a little too complicated, frankly, for what our purposes are. Okay, nobody's ever heard of EFT. That's interesting. All right, here's what it was years and years ago. About 25 years or more ago in the first Gulf War, a lot of soldiers were coming back. And it wasn't the first time PTSD ever occurred with soldiers. We had what was called shell shock in the first World War. And soldiers came back and medication was just not working. This was developed to help neutralize that reactive behavior so that if there was a loud sound, they didn't hit the deck or freak out or cause their families all kinds of grief. It is not woo-woo. It has been scientifically proven. It works directly on your subconscious. How does it work? Think of it as acupuncture for the brain. No, we're not going to put needles in your head. We're going to gently tap with your fingertips at various meridian points around your body, because acupuncture has also been proven. It's not woo-woo either. It's accepted by the medical establishment. So you're tapping instead of using needles, and you're using certain setup phrases. Now, a guy named Gary Craig, that's the name of the one who wrote that book on the left, he didn't invent it, but he popularized it. And as a result, if you go to, uh, I guess it's GaryCraig.com probably, or you can go to Amazon and just post Gary Craig or just Google Gary Craig. He's not the only one. My Lord. Uh, let me go back one. He 
led a revolution, if you will, in EFT. And there's many, many, many forms of it now. You would not believe how many forms of it. But here's the thing that's really weird. Once soldiers were finding that they could get help with PTSD, guess who picked up on it first and started using it? People who wanted to operate at high levels of stress and achieve excellence, professional athletes. Michael Jordan used it. He was, if you pay close attention to old videos of him when the Bulls were dominating way back in the 90s, he was tapping. And a lot of athletes do it. If, you've, if you're a, a, a golfer, for example, and you got the yips, if you know what the yips are, that's where you're six inches from the cup and you're about to stroke the ball and all of a sudden you hit it too hard and it hits the cup and bounces away. And a lot of people pay thousands of dollars to fix that. You know what? EFT will fix it in five minutes. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be any kind of professional. It works on trading. However, I don't want you to start using it on trading. Use it on dinky things like if somebody cuts you off in traffic and you get annoyed and you want to flip them off or get road rage or something, tap instead. It'll calm you down. Or if your spouse or significant other is using a certain tone of voice and it gets you really annoyed and you don't want to start an argument, use tapping. It helps. It truly, truly does. Yeah, exactly. That's what Danny says. Emotional freedom, also known as tapping, sometimes called meridian technique because it follows those acupuncture meridians. So you can find all you need to know about it on YouTube and Google, etc. And as I said, NLP is a little more sophisticated. Uh, I don't recommend unless you're already trained in it that you use it. If you're already trained in it, then why are you here? You probably already know how to maintain your own equilibrium. <laughs> okay. So finally, a real stripped down, easy version of EFT, because we're really running out of time here, is SET. It was invented by a doctor in Australia, and it doesn't require you to tap all over your body and stuff like that, just on your hand. And it's mainly about just doing it continuously. If you Google a search for SET, you will find it. All right. Finally, if you have a mechanical trading system, you've got a real rules-based Boolean logic approach to trading that strips out the emotions. At least if it's semi-automated. I don't recommend fully automated because it doesn't account for all kinds of conditions. Instead, use something semi-automated where if you recognize a context before a trade is ready to go, you can say, I don't want to get into that trade. I'll stand aside. But the moment you're in the trade with the mechanical trading system we have, it totally takes over parks the stop and the target with an OCO order. It'll move the stop to break even in a tick of profit. So it'll hedge your bet. And depending on whether you're using a scalping exit strategy or a scale out exit strategy, if it's scale out, it'll automatically trail the stop for you. I would love to demonstrate it, but this is not the venue for it, nor the event we're focusing on discipline and trading psychology. But the main thing I want you to know is that this trade domination system has no subjectivity or discretion built into it whatsoever. It is extremely consistent. It creates a disciplined environment because of its automation and its rules, and it will allow you to achieve that consistency far 